Keeping and breeding fish can be a lot of work. I try, as I'm sure many of you do, to find new tools and strategies that might help to make the most of that work, to get the best result for maybe not the least amount of effort, but a manageable amount. Effective, efficient, repeatable, these are words I put a lot of stock in, usually. There are times, though, when I do things that don't fit those criteria at all, things that are sure to be much more effort than they're worth, and for no other reason than because they're fun. I'm going to show you a few examples today, along with some new species coming down the pipeline. I'll start with these Corydora similis. I've shown them once before, about 10 months ago, and that number is significant because by now I would have expected to be finishing rather than just beginning to breed them. To be fair, I haven't applied much effort to triggering spawns until recently, but I'm used to seeing a little bit of activity by now even without much effort. These have felt uncharacteristically sluggish. For me, this renewed a long-standing interest in what more I can do to recreate the environmental changes that would bring on their breeding season. I'm already a strong believer in cool water changes as a trigger, but there's more to rain than just a temporary drop in water temperature. For example, what about the sound or sensation of rainfall hitting the water? That seemed like a fun problem to solve. This tank happens to be filtered in part by a power head with a venturi opening. I've found in the past that if the power head's flow is restricted, water will be pumped out of the venturi rather than air drawn in. Using an airline tube, I directed that flow into a perforated rigid tube attached to the tank lid. With that, I made myself some rain. And what about the temperature? Aside from temporary drops in water temperature following rain, there should also be some seasonal shift in the average temperature of the air and water. In practical terms, the question becomes, what if anything should I do with my tank heater? Now, because I live in the northern hemisphere, I normally associate rain with cold. But in South America, where these fish are from, they often have an inverse relationship. It's a big continent, but in many regions it appears that heavy rains come during the hottest parts of the year, not the coldest. With that in mind, I tried increasing the temperature by a few degrees while continuing to do cool water changes. Finally, after many months of living rent-free, they started to spawn. The temperature change, I think, is what actually made the difference here. My little rain simulator, as cool as I think it is, was probably little help. But it was fun, and I like the sound. One other aspect of rain, and I should say real rain, is a drop in barometric pressure. This is another often cited trigger for spawning Corydoras that if your cool water changes happen to coincide with the pressure drop preceding a real storm, the odds of a spawn are even greater. When I hear this, my first thought is, well, I can't control the weather, but my second thought is, of course I can. I've bought and played with vacuum pumps and barometric pressure gauges to see if I can do exactly that. What I found, though, was that they're too loud to run for extended periods of time and also probably unnecessary. My thinking is, by increasing the water temperature in a tank with a lid, there's probably a pocket of lower pressure formed in the airspace between the water and the lid. I can't promise I'll never try the pumps again, but for the time being, I don't think I'll need to. So they're finally spawning, and like I've seen in other species, it's much easier to keep them spawning than it is to get them to start. Unfortunately, the fertility rate so far has been miserable, which I'm attributing to having, I believe, only one male. But help is on the way. A couple of weeks ago, I brought in a few more similis, and if even one of these is a male, I think I ought to be in good shape. I know the recommendation is to have two or more males to every female, but in my experience, the females don't all spawn at once. I usually see only one or two females spawning on any given day, and in that case, two or more males should get the job done just fine. They're in quarantine right now along with some Aspidorus spilotus, which I'm very happy to have found. Controlling the airspace above them is a group of Beckford's pencil fish, which I'll be working into my rotation of egg scatterers. I have quite a few species ahead of these, but my guess is you'll see them again sometime next year. The similis, if any are male, I'm hoping will be able to participate in a spawn a bit sooner than I would expect from new females. I don't know how true this is, but I've been getting the impression, just from watching, that males might become sexually mature more quickly than females which is something I've been thinking about often as I watch this group of Corydoras loxazonis in the next tank over. I've had these for about six months. They were wild caught, so it's anyone's guess how old they are, but they were very small when I got them, and their features struck me as immature, so I'm guessing they were only a few months old. Still, they've seemed very comfortable, and for almost as long as I've had them, I've noticed the smaller males doing their fluttering dance in front of the females, a signal that they at least would like to start spawning. 
as I move the younger Similis in with my adults, I'll be very interested to see how the younger males behave. As for these Loxazonas, my gut tells me they're about ready to start spawning any day now. At the moment, they're sharing a tank with a couple of small angelfish. And that's kind of a big deal for me. I've always had a strict policy of avoiding fish that get larger than 3 or 4 inches, but I've also known that at some point I would have to break that rule for angelfish, if nothing else, because what kind of self-respecting fish breeder hasn't bred angelfish? So I've relented. What's taken me so long is finding a strain that I actually want to breed. For years, as I've walked by tanks of angelfish, they've never struck me as something I wanted to make more of. Don't get me wrong, I can appreciate the products of line breeding, but I've seen my fair share of its consequences, and raising a few hundred bug-eyed Chernobyl monsters with missing fins and sling blade underbites is not my idea of a good time. Even on a good day, half of them look like a kid colored them in with the wrong crayons. I'm sure you get the point. So that leaves me with either carefully curated breeding stock or wild strains. I went with option two. I expect they'll be a little harder to sell, but they've got the right number of fingers and toes, and that's really all I care about. These were captive raised, but they're only three generations away from the wild. I've really enjoyed getting to see what angelfish fins and color patterns are actually supposed to look like. They're beautiful. I've also been fascinated with their behavior, which strikes me as almost goofy. With their long fins and toe, the way they tilt and spin as they explore the tank or negotiate dominance amongst themselves can look a little less graceful than their name would imply. That competition for dominance seems to take up a good deal of their time. These two are here hanging out with a herd of cattle because they lost. They should be over here with the rest of their group, which are now two or three times their size. I'm no stranger to cichlids or to the abuses they can subject each other to, what struck me as unique about these angels is that their competitive aggression seems to lead to a pecking order in a more literal sense than I've seen before. Most of the cichlids I've dealt with will take a few body shots from a bully in exchange for food. They don't want to, but they will. These angelfish, on the other hand, have seemed actually to stop eating if they feel outmatched. They won't even try. The less they eat, the weaker they get, and the more vulnerable they are to further abuse. To keep them safe, I moved these two into a separate tank to give them some time to relax and put on some weight. They resumed eating almost immediately, and the larger of these two has doubled in size in the last few weeks. The smaller one is struggling a bit and may be dealing with some illness, but I'm betting that if I removed the larger one, it would quickly begin to put on size. Even these larger ones, as I understand it, are still months away from a breeding size, and I can only hope that I have both sexes. I guess we'll find out soon. In the meantime, I get to do other fun things, like finding an angelfish cone. This might sound strange, but as a hobbyist, I've always wanted to own an angelfish cone, easily more than the angelfish themselves. Maybe less as something I cared to use, and more as a symbol of something I wanted to be. A bit like a cook buying their first chef's knife. It feels very official. Rather than buy one, I made one. After the fry tray, I've taken a few cracks at solving other problems with a 3D printer, and this is one of them. I was able to choose my own dimensions, and best of all, throw in my own wacky idea by making it sectional. The cone is divided into seven segments, each sliding on a central post and secured in place by the top of the cone, which is threaded. You might be wondering, what could this possibly accomplish? I'm glad you asked. The purpose of these segments is birth control, or if you prefer the euphemism, family planning. This might work better in my mind than in practice, but what I imagine doing is taking the cone with eggs covering one side and removing only a desired number of segments to hatch artificially. This is insurance against a spawn much larger than I care to raise. I imagine the segments would also fit into a smaller hatching container than the whole cone. I have no idea if this will work, but I got my chef's knife, and a special one at that. And now back to the fish. I'm a bit heavy on Cory's right now, but it's easy to do given that they can so easily share space with other species. Here I have a group of Scleromystax barbatus. In every group of related species, there are usually one or two that stand out to me as a particular interest. I have two such species right now, and this is one of them. Of the Corydoras and other related species, this is the one I've always found most intriguing. Their color and patterns are beautiful, and they have this shimmer that you can really only see in person as they turn. Many fish can shimmer as the light hits them from different angles, but this to me is different. It's dense and almost metallic, like a holographic trading card. Some of you 80s and 90s kids will know what I mean. 
These grow larger than most Corydoras, and might already be larger than any other in my possession, except maybe Jaws, if you remember her. I can't judge their maturity as well, but I have a feeling that these two are nearly ready to start spawning. They need to move out of here soon, but at the moment they're sharing this tank with a small group of Pseudomugil Luminatus. I brought these in and quarantined them together with the Barbatus, and they've both done very well in an unheated tank. I've been wanting to breed one of these smaller Pseudomugil rainbows before someone makes good on their threats to reclassify them. This tank is down low, so I don't see them quite as often, but I love their color. I actually bought these on accident while trying to buy Fricatus, but it's turned out to be a happy accident. Having seen both, I think I like these better. Still, I learned a lesson not to order fish after midnight. I have a spawning mop in here, which they keep constantly littered with eggs. I like to feed my fish well, and for many of the females, that can lead to a heavy egg load. Even though I'm not actively trying to breed these fish yet, I have a feeling that it's better to give females a chance to keep those eggs moving. Some species will just drop them mid-water, Others, particularly mop spawners in my observation, can really bloat out if not given a suitable spawning site. I see a loose fry every once in a while, but they never last long. It's encouraging, though, to know that they're ready as soon as I start pulling the mop. It might not seem like this, based on the sequence of videos, but in my own mind, I've been referring to this last year as the year of the spawning mop. They're in half of my tanks, sitting dry on top of the other half, I'm practically finding them in coat pockets. Right now, though, the one I care most to check is living with a pair of gardener eye killifish. I'm into my third generation now of this species, and I'm about ready to wrap things up and move on. Before I do, though, I'm using them to test drive a new style of spawning mop that I thought, before trying to make one, sounded like a great idea. Gardener eye seemed to me to be very easy to breed in some number, but difficult to breed in large numbers. The females, as I've learned recently, are capable of amassing an almost comically large number of eggs, but they don't seem to have the patience to release them all while dealing with the persistent advances of a male. Of the relatively small number that they do manage to lay, I've seen many of them eaten by the parents almost immediately afterward. I tend to write this off as fish being fish, which is to say, not that smart, but part of the blame lies, I think, with the structure of our spawning mops. The objective of an artificial mop, as I see it, is to simulate the vertical growth of some probably marginal vegetation. Our mops make for a passable approximation, but I don't think the density of their strands do them any favors. What I see is a concentration of eggs around the outside of the mop, which makes them easy targets for the parents. Many eggs also fall straight down and land below the mop rather than adhering to it. I have this thought that we might be better served by a mop with a looser structure that the fish can easily get inside of and be surrounded by strands on all sides. To accomplish that, I based a mop around a small square of plastic egg crate with a loop of backer rod attached to it for buoyancy. I cut and tied each strand of yarn individually, and this was exactly as time-consuming as you might think, but it turned out exactly as I hoped it would. With this structure, the fish do swim inside rather than hovering around the outside of the mop. How this affects productivity, I can't say yet with confidence. It's too early to tell. What I do know is that if you try to make one, you'll want to stop after about 30 minutes and write me some hate mail. And I understand that. I hated me too while I was making it. If it works as well as I hope, I'm sure you'll see it again soon. There's another experiment I have planned focused on green water. I have heard quite a few times that green water makes a great food source for exceptionally small fry. I believe it, but I have a hard time visualizing how that would work, so I've decided I just have to try it for myself and find out. The first step was to start and then maintain a stable green water culture, and for the last several months, I have. I have two of these cultures, and so far they've been sitting on a shelf like big green lava lamps. I just need to find the right species to try them on. I know of at least one fish farm that uses green water as a fry food, but they concentrate it with an industrial centrifuge. I don't have one, and I don't intend to buy one, so once again, I turned to the 3D printer. I made myself a centrifuge rotor that could be powered by a rotary tool with a mandrel attachment. I sized the openings to fit 15 milliliter tubes, which takes about as much power as a hand tool can provide. Personally, I love the sound that this thing makes. Let me see if I can demonstrate that for you. I did the math once to find the g-force at the end of these tubes, and it's mind-boggling. 
The irony of running this thing in a house full of glass aquariums does not escape me. After about a minute, the fine particulates of algae are concentrated into the ends of the tubes. I can drain off the excess water, and what's left is a mass of ostensibly nutritious algae, free from the highly concentrated fertilizer used to sustain the green water culture. I was curious if I could use this same method to concentrate paramecium and separate them from the relatively gross water that they're cultured in. I can't subject them to as much force as the grain water. That would kill them. The greater challenge, I found, was what they do if I don't kill them. They move. As soon as I ease off the pressure, they immediately disperse back throughout the tube. So to make this work, I made myself what I've been calling a paramecium trap. It's an insert for the centrifuge tube with a small funnel shape at the bottom and a very small opening. My thinking was it could work a bit like a crab pot. It's easy for them to pass through the funnel as they're forced downward, but difficult for them to find their way back out. I don't know if the effort to concentrate is worthwhile, it probably isn't, but the trap works. I mentioned earlier that I have two species of fish that for some reason mean a little more to me than most others. These are the second, Epistogramma benchai. They aren't the rarest or most expensive fish I've had in my possession, but to me they're the holy grail of my dwarf cichlid ambitions. Their striking color patterns and the aggressively high dorsals of the males are emblematic of what makes cichlids so interesting. This male and female have been living together comfortably for several months, and they've managed a few small spawns in that time, but I've kept this tank deliberately inconducive to raising fry. I'm not quite ready to film it, and I hate being caught unprepared. There's something I have to figure out first. On the last Episto species, which was Elizabeth A., that female almost drove me crazy. For some reason, she had this determination, uncharacteristic of a cave spawner, to place her eggs as close to the camera and light source as possible, which made it impossible to get clear shots of the spawn. Far be it from me to tell a fish how to lay eggs, but I say, unacceptable. What I've been working on is a cave designed, among other things, to strongly discourage placing eggs near the camera. This is what I've come up with. The shape and dimensions are generally similar to the half flower pots I've been using, but with a region of spikes, for lack of a better word, at the back of the ceiling to hopefully make it an unattractive place to lay eggs. I know it's got a very medieval torture device look to it, but A, the spikes are blunted, and B, I refuse to be outsmarted by a fish. So we'll see how this goes. That's the last of the new species, at least until a package comes next week, but I do have one more project to show you, real quick. It was suggested to me that I take a shot at improving the Zis brine shrimp hatchery's notoriously bad stand. So here's what I've come up with. A tall 3D printed stand designed to work without the front two legs and remove any obstructions to reaching the valve and draining your batch of shrimp. It's rhetorically guaranteed to suck at least 80% less than the original stand, and after some additional testing, we'll be coming to a Patreon near you. So stay tuned. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you next time.